Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are back to the Agorist Unconference. We've been through our first speaker. We're here in Valley Forge. Just to let you know, my name is Ken Crawchuk. I'll be your host today. I was the Libertarian candidate for governor of Pennsylvania in 2002. Incidentally, the last third-party candidate to appear on the Pennsylvania ballot for governor because our ballot access laws here are atrocious. Somebody should call Amnesty International. We're going to move right along with our cast of speakers. Before I do, though, I'd like to just remind you this is one of four channels that's being broadcast. This is the Agorism channel. There's also one of Peaceful Evolution, Creative Media, and the Entrepreneur Network. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our numerous sponsors which made today possible. They include freekeen.com, K-E-A-N-E, the Foundation for a Free Society, the Liberty Voice, Freedom Engineering Project, Global Net of Anarchy and Peace, Fully Informed Jury Association, the Center for a Stateless Society, Porkfest, Edgar the Exploiter, Bitcoin, Dotson for Congress, LarkinRose.com, and DellValleySilver.com. Which brings me to the introduction of our next speaker, Karen Embry. Karen has a master's degree from Walsh College in Troy, Michigan in finance with her concentration in Austrian economics. She moved to the Philadelphia area in 2007 after the initial slowdown of the economy from Detroit. Karen and her husband are both, Repu her husband Bob, are both Republican committeemen, or committee persons, let us be politically correct here, and they're very active in local politics. Karen founded Del Valley Silver, Del Valley Silver in 2009 with improving the nation's economy in mind. Through Silver Barter, Del Valley Silver exists to bring sanity and stability back to our local area. Please join me in welcoming Karen Emery. They made the microphone shorter for me, but I still feel like I've got to reach up to, to see my notes, but we'll deal with that. The, the problem of being short, what God gave me. My, my topic is on silver barter, back to our roots. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would have never believed that I'd be standing here, that I'd own a company that was involved with uh, formation of silver barter. I didn't even know really the value of silver or gold. A couple of years ago, I was at Fort Fest in, in New Hampshire, uh, put on by the Free Staters, and I bought my very first ounce of silver, and I bought it for $16. And it was nice. It, it just, it, it kept, uh, it was shiny, and it felt like real money, and it made me feel good. But I started thinking, well, I don't think that silver should just sit there being silver. We should actually be able to use it. So through that, I, I thought, well, somebody should start a company that does silver barter. And it just kind of came back to, well, I'm the only one here. So, all right, I'll step up and I'll try. I didn't know anything about bartering. I didn't know anything about how to mint a coin, anything like that. So I, I did have my um, Austrian economics background that showed me that silver barter is the way to go, that you want to have a monetary policy that has intrinsic value. And so I just started from there. It's been trial and error. Today I'm going to talk about silver barter, how that's pretty much like an oxymoronic statement to begin with, because silver and barter are two of the same terms. I'm going to go through what barter is, why it is that we wanted to accept silver or gold as a form of currency when we established our nation. Uh, I'm going to go through just how far off the mark we've come since the founding of our nation to, to where we've pretty much lost all hope of any stability in our currency. And why Del Valley Silver was started to try to, to bridge that gap. Um, if I have time at the end, we'll do question and answers. And then at the very end, I have a little pet project that I uh, would like to talk about. That's about the drug war. A little off topic, but if I have time, that's where I'm going with this. 
Okay, silver barter. Back to our roots. Okay, what is barter, first of all? Barter is basically nothing other than trade. I have a cow, you have some chickens, we figure out how we can make that equal and we trade it. It's hard to trade cows. You may you don't you don't need a whole cow, you only need a side of beef. You only have a, a dozen eggs. So that's where the money part came in. Something that we all agree that has value. And we're all on the same page with what intrinsic value that it carries on. So in other words, uh, one ounce of silver is worth one ounce of silver. It's always going to be worth one ounce of silver. It doesn't matter what the price is on Federal Reserve dollars. We're almost like uh, back in the ages when the, we believed that the, the earth was flat and then we believed that the, everything revolved around the earth, the sun revolved around the earth. We had a different perspective. We've lost that perspective here too because we want to, we think, oh, the price of silver is going up. The price of silver isn't going up. Silver is silver. A house is a house. A horse is a horse. It's the value of what trading that's really getting out of whack. So silver barter is is an oxymoron because silver and barter are the same thing. You could trade in silver, you could trade in gold, you could trade in feathers. As long as people understand the value of what you're trading in, you have money. So let me set the scene here. Um, we, we just got done with a, a revolutionary war. We've got a lot of people who were soldiers who did not get paid. We have an Articles of Confederation that tells us, gives us suggestions on how the states are going to pay back the debt, the war debt. We have Pennsylvania currency, Maryland currency. Every colony has its own method of trade. There's, because of the war, we went off a silver or gold standard and started printing paper, inflation ensued. So we have got, we've got pretty much chaos. And the Articles of Confederation just says, well, the states are supposed to chip in and, but there was no like law, there was no way to enforce it. So what the people did is the founding fathers, they went back to who they thought were, uh, experts in the matter. And one of those such people was William Blackstone. He was an English jurist in the 1760s. He wrote a commentary on the laws of England. I think a five volume set, so it's extremely uh, comprehensive. And in it, he talks about what is money. The Founding Fathers looked at that when coming up with our own value of what money is. And money is something that everyone agrees has value. Think about our dollar today. There's, there's nothing backing it up. So we've gone from a silver gold standard to a in government we trust standard, and that's kind of sad. Why do we pick metals? as a basis of trade. Well, first of all, they're durable. They're divisible. You can make them into smaller pieces, larger pieces for whatever. You don't have to trade a whole cow. You can do the piece of the, the loaf of bread. And it's easily reduced to one standard. People in France understand gold and silver just as much as they do here. People in England have the same standard. Actually, in, in, in the time of the founders, the English people had a gold standard and the French people had a silver standard. 
the ratio was a little bit differently, but it, it still worked because it was about, I think, 15 to 1 gold to silver ratio, uh, 14 to 1 in France. It, it varied. Now we're looking at a silver ratio of 48 to 1. Everything's just got that misconstrued. So why do we why do we um, have an Article One, Section Eight, Clause Five? That's from our Constitution. It says Congress should have the power, one, to coin money, to regulate the value of foreign coin, and to fix the standard of weights and measures. This was so that the army could get paid. This is so that we all are on one page and we don't have to worry about, well, I have New Hampshire currency here and what will you give me for the Pennsylvania currency? It puts us all on the same standard. And what they decided to do with that is, is use a, a silver standard. The dollar is, is worth a certain amount of grains which is a, um, a uh, weight. I had a thing on the Coin Act, and I don't see what that is here, but it was uh, 1785 where we, decided, we um, created a coinage act. And what that did is it, it created the mint. It said that you can bring your silver, you can bring your gold to the mint and turn it into coins. We can't do that now. We got to the point where we, we did have silver certificates that we could trade in that in the 1950s even. And, uh, but we can't trade those in anymore either. Basically, we're, we're untethered. We, we have a dollar and the dollar's worth Intrinsically nothing, and unless people stopped or started accepting it, that basically it's by faith, and that's not the way it was intended. It was intended to be based on gold or silver, something that's intrinsic worth, something that we can always count on. Now, in infl there's inflation in a hundred percent metal standard as well. It, it, it could be that a whole vein of silver or gold is, is found. And that, what that, that would make more silver or gold available to the masses, which would make all the prices rise. Consequently, if there's some sort of danger and you lose a bunch of metal, prices would fall because there's not as much there. Now, when it comes to the way things are today, um, it's not tethered to anything. Back in 1913, the Federal Reserve was created. It was basically a banking cartel that took us further and further away from real money that we could trade value for value. We started creating money out of thin air uh, in 1933, President Roosevelt decided to take us off the gold standard, so we're not even tethered to gold anymore. The only only uh, four nations were able to cash in their gold. The American people had to give up their gold because they wanted to take that power away. They're trying to get us off the standard so that we have to rely on the government standard. The Federal Reserve creates money out of thin air, like I said before. We've gotten to the point where there's over $930 billion out there. The more dollars you put out there, the less they're worth. So in, back to 1933, uh, that, that was a time when only gold could be owned by dentists, jewelers, things like that. So one thing I sometimes wear around my neck is a, a $5 gold piece. 
that my grandmother passed down to me. She was able to keep that because she made it into medallion. She made it into jewelry. Most people didn't. They just took the government at their word and gave up their gold. Uh, the $5 gold piece was like really special to me for that reason. And $5 gold piece obviously used to be worth $5. Now it's worth two, three hundred dollars So you could see how our monetary standards are just going, going crazy. The dollar of 1913 is worth less than four cents today. Does, does that mean that what we have is not worth it? See, I, I live in a town called Levittown, and I picked up this book, and I noticed that in 1954, the price of my house was $11,000. $250, $70 a month. I bought the house four years ago for $200,000. Is the house worth more now? No, it's the same house, same amount of bedrooms. It has air conditioners, so maybe it's, maybe it's increased value a little bit. But basically, the house is a house. What was trading for $11,000 in the 50s is trading for over $200,000 today. And we need to get away from that. That's one of the reasons why I started Del Valle Silver. And so that we can have people opt out of the Federal Reserve. We can have people trade value for value. Now, in the beginning one, we started with the mint. The mint would able, be able to add non-precious metals to the, to the coinage, and that's how they would get their profit. Now, Del Valley Silver doesn't have that option. We're a barter network because the government won't let us trade silver coins, so we have to say we're silver barter, which is rather redundant. But in order to make it legal, we, um, we have to do it under the barter system. So in order for me, I can't charge people for my minting. So what we're doing is we're charging membership fees for people who voluntarily want to get out of the Federal Reserve and want to start trading value for value. Let's make our own sub-economy. It's on a voluntary basis. Uh, starting in approximately probably by the beginning of April, we're changing our model. What we used to do is we used to charge 10 ounces of silver for a membership for a year. Just in the year and a half that I've owned the business, silver's gone up 200%. So it's pricing, it's pricing numbers out of the market. So what we decided to do is we decided to go on the fiat standard, the fiat dollar standard, and charge $150 for memberships rather than 10 ounces of silver. Try to keep it steady. As our fiat money decreases, so will the membership fees. So it kind of keeps it more on an even keel that uh, merchants can be more enticed to join our network. Anybody who refers a merchant gets a hundred of those dollars. I want that to, so that you have a stake in your own economy. So if you want to trade with a butcher, you get the butcher in there and the butcher signs off and then you can trade silver, silver for real value. Starting April 1st or thereabouts, it's going to be, um, it's not going to be a free consumer membership anymore either. We're going to have charge $25 for consumers to be able to get our rate. Um, the first year of in business, we were trying to keep everything as close to spot as possible. We want silver out there. We want it traded to people. We want to actually start this economy with, if people act out and start trading in silver voluntarily, it's going to push away the Federal Reserve. But we, we refuse to, to make money on the silver. 
So I, I had a quandary. We, we lost, I don't know, over $26,000 our first year in business because I refused to do that. I refused to put a premium on the silver. So in order to change that, what we've come up with is a $25 subscription fee for, for consumer members. We're going to keep the prices the same. The prices are going to be as close as spot as possible. We still have the ounce, quarter ounce, and half ounce variations. And, uh, but in order to buy the silver, you're going to have to be part of the network. Maybe that'll help defray our cost, and we'll still be able to do what I really think we need to be done is get away from the dollar. Um, Is there anybody that has any questions? Why did Burger go to jail? That's a very good question. The government is saying that the dollar was being counterfeited, which makes no sense because since when does a counterfeit item worth more than the original? But when does a kind of counterfeit look different? And the counterfeit looks different, but they, they the government is saying that the liberty the, in God we trust, in liberty, the dollar sign, all that was something that the government has control over. They just don't like competition. They don't like competition. And should we get big enough, we, we haven't done any of those things. What we did was we used the indictment for them and we made sure we didn't do those things. We don't have anything that looks like an eagle on our stuff. We don't have you know, um, dollar signs. We don't have anything that tells anything other than the weight and the purity of the coin. So we're trying to get around that. But it's the same thing. If they get scared, the government's going to find, they, they make up the rules as they go along. As we said in the very beginning of the talk, silver is money. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to trade with silver of our own volition, because that's never been changed. Yes? Uh, we have a question from the online audience. John DiLiberto asks, how difficult has it become to obtain physical silver now? It, it has gotten, it's quite scarce. We used to turn around our orders within a week or two. Uh, now we are, wait, we've been waiting for four weeks and our last order of silver. The mints just can't get enough. I'm not sure it will supply and demand. Um, with the prices going up, the supply is going down. So this is going to take a little while for us to get our supplies out there. But yeah, that's a very good question. It's hard to, hard to come by. So how does that work when you place an order for silver? Do you agree to pay the price today and take delivery later? Or is it based on a future value? Or how exactly does that work for you guys? It goes by the current value of the silver on the day of the trade. So um, if, if somebody places an order for $25,000 in silver today, we go by the market value of the silver today. And then the mint, in turn, buys the silver today. We then have to wait for the delivery and the printing and all that to be done. Yes, sir. Uh, seems to me like a lot of people are stocking up on silver and gold because they know the dollar is falling apart. They don't want to store their wealth as something worthless. Um, it would be nice if they understood that if they were trading in silver, you don't have to hoard it. Like if they were using it as barter, it works just fine. You don't have to hide a pile of it. Just let the dollar collapse while we trade the way you're talking about. That's exactly true. And we're, we have the same problem with Dow Valley Silver. People buy the silver and they hoard it. They're putting it in their walls or whatever they're doing with it. It's really it's counterproductive. Because what the whole idea here is let's get the silver out there. Let's start a network of people in our community, like Steve Sheets was talking about, let's get our community involved in changing the way things are locally. That's totally what we're committed to do, is we want your local butcher, barber, 
anybody that you want to trade with, get them all involved in starting to trade in silver. All of our merchants, they accept silver at a premium, so you get more than the Federal Reserve amount out of it. The consumer wins, the merchant gets silver, everyone should be happy. It's a win-win situation, and the government isn't making money out of thin air, at least not what, we're, how we're not participating in it. Yes? Karen, maybe you can help me. I agree with you that we should get the silver out there, but personally, I don't want to part with any of my silver. I have a lot of old American coins. I can go in there with a dime. It's now worth, what, three and a half dollars or something like that? Would, how can you convince me to part with my silver? Because it just keep going up and up and up. I'm because, afraid to give it away now. Because you're going to be getting more than the value of the silver when you're trading it. So you will be saving money. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking of next week. Next week it's going to be 370. Next week after that's going to be 380. That's and true. And it, it will be. But within the barter network, it's going to start, a consistency will be established that your one ounce of silver is going to get you so much goods, no matter what the Federal Reserve equivalent is. So it, in the end, it's, it's in phase. It's going to be phase at the beginning, and that's the problem that we're having right now, is people are saying, oh, no, I want to keep my gold. I want to keep my silver. And in a way, that's, that's hindering the cause, because we can't trade with it if it's not being traded. So what we do is we make it available as cheaply as possible. And now it's up to you guys, if really, if you want a sub-economy, if you want to trade in real money, the, the method's there. We have the system. Have you considered diversifying the movement beyond just silver commodities and other possible border commodities? And you think silver is definitely the way to go? Silver is good for the mom and pop stores. Silver is good for trading meals. Silver is good uh, for most things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why we stayed with silver. We could trade in gold, but then you'd be buying houses. <laughs> you'd be buying a car. You don't want to take a big, you know, chunk of silver. And, and trade it. So there, there is the point where, yes, gold is something that is viable, but it, it has its place. So for us being a small company, we have to choose. We have to choose between um, getting the silver out there and we can't diversify. If we've got silver, gold, platinum, copper, it, it puts our, our money in too many small places that it, it won't have an impact. So what we're trying to do is put all our eggs in one basket, use silver, and maybe there's a market for it out there. I agree with you. But, you know, as far as us, we have to keep as to the mission to try to get the, the silver trading. So you have basically a list that you give to your subscribers as to who else in the area is subscribing to your system and who they can go and take their silver to and who they can basically get business from, in other words, right? Yes. On DellValleySilver.com is a list of all of the merchants that are subscribed. Uh, it, it's their advertising price for the year. It's $150, which you can't beat that for any advertising. And you target market, you've got a, a whole bunch of Liberty people tuning in to check to see if there's a, a new merchant coming in. Karen, we have a web question from John B. Liberta. What are the mechanisms by which silver barter exchange rates are determined? That is up to the merchant. The silver exchange rates some merchants want to do it on a per project basis, like our web designer will do a certain amount of silver for designing a website. Uh, the place where I take karate gives you $5 over whatever the spot price of silver is, so that you know at any given time when you're trading it, you're getting more value than you would with the Federal Reserve dollars. 
gives the people the incentive to start trading in silver. And he's tickled about it because he started trading at $20 and we're now up to like 37 So he's, he's doubled his value just for taking a chance on a small company and um, it, it would work for others as well. Yes. I know you guys are primarily using like 0.99 silver and stuff, but when it comes down to like some of those smaller coins, like we were talking about earlier, like where there's like mixed metals involved in there, how, how are we supposed to keep track of stuff like that when we're bartering and trading with people? Like, you know, if I got this diamond that's got silver and um, nickel in it or whatever, from whenever, it, you kind of get what I'm saying? Like, well, there's copper coins out there too, which has right. a dollar amount attached to it, so it's kind of easier for people to, to value it when they're trading, but when you have like other mixed coins and stuff. Basically, it's let the consumer beware. It's part of what we do is to educate the people on the value of their money. For instance, a nickel is worth more than a nickel. That's about the only currency we have now that is actually worth more than the space value. You have to know that silver quarters pre-1964 and dimes are worth a lot more because they're 90% silver. People need to, to know that and be um, intelligent traders. What we have is we have 0.999 grade silver because it's easy to test and it, it's something that's a standard. We're, we're not taking and putting base metals in for our profit because we're going to do our profit through a sub subscription basis. This way, you know when you get, you have 100% silver. Should you want to trade with quarters or dimes pre-1964, that's great. But just be intelligent on you know, what the market value is. And once you start trading it, it it's going to become its own standard. What could we do to help our friends right here at Valley Forge Beef and Ale understand the value of accepting silver in exchange for their high quality beer? <laughs> but a lot of people I don't understand trading in silver, but they understand coupons. So what I suggest when people are going to restaurants or going to different businesses, is they tell them it's a coupon that they're not going to want to throw away. For one ounce of silver, maybe you can get the special of the day. They're, they're then going to keep the silver and uh, rather than throwing away the coupon, having to print again, the 50% off coupon is very frequently used in restaurants to, to bring in extra people. And this is the same concept. Use a, a silver coupon instead. That is whatever value that you would normally use as a coupon. But then you also have the intrinsic value. You don't just throw away a piece of paper and give away 50% of a meal. You also, you, you're going to get value for value. And that's the whole point of learning to trade in silver. So then help because coupon, your coupon can be used at many different places so they don't you have a coupon they can use everywhere? Yes, you can use the coupon everywhere and if there's nowhere to use it, it goes back to the market value. It's still worth silver. If, if you get out of the barter network, you still have silver. If you want to trade within the barter network, you're going to get silver plus the value, the premium that other people give you. So basically, you're going to be getting more for your value. You'll be able to live cheaper if you trade in silver once we get the base started and people start trusting in their community. That's basically what we want to do is we want the mom and pop shop to thrive. With the banking laws the way they are, you can't borrow money unless you have money. The interest is phenomenal. So if we could get our mom and pop shops to start trading among themselves with their excess capacity, they won't need the loan because they'll be able to use their excess capacity to trade in silver and get more business that way. That would be a definite boost to our economy. Karen, we have a red, uh, web request that you repeat the question because you can't always hear the okay. question. 
accept silver as partial payment as their bills are being paid? Okay, the question is, will utility companies accept silver as partial payment? I'm thinking that if a small utility company would be able to do that. Um, larger companies, they're too in the bed of the dollar to be able to do anything like that. It's if there's demand is there, then the, the businesses are going to follow. The hardest part now is to get a base of trading. Once there's a base of trading, then the trading is accepted. It's, it's going to skyrocket because people will understand it and they'll get their um, value out of it. Anything else on silver? Okay. Um, the last little bit, I, I want to just change topics just, just a little bit. Um, something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I, most of you know that, that know Bob and I, that oh, we're our, my daughter, her, his stepdaughter, was murdered four months ago, uh, almost four months ago today. And she was murdered by a heroin dealer. It, it, it bothers me to no end the fact that the war on drugs is killing people. The war on drugs is making everything go underground. And I really believe my daughter lost her life because heroin is illegal. Is heroin a good idea? I don't know. That, that's not the issue. Heroin is totally addictive. But that's her choice. Her choice was to add the substance to her body. It didn't, it, it, she had to go to all these illicit channels and in order to get what she wanted. The, just like in prohibition, the quality, you, you can't tell the quality or the, the, of what you're getting. You don't know because it's all underground. The, the government trying to regulate what people put in their bodies it's ludicrous. And I, I just want people to know that um, the, the district attorney won't even arrest this, this drug dealer because he says he didn't do it. It's really crazy thinking. Um, stay tuned. We're going to be organizing some sort of a candlelight vigil or so on our six month anniversary, which is in June to bring the, to the attention the fact that these drug laws are killing people, they're hurting people. Let's put the money instead of into drug enforcement into drug treatment. Um, yes? Karen, we have another web question. What's your assessment of consti constitutional tender laws advancing through a number of states right now, most notably Utah? Yes, Utah. Uh, uh, decided that it wants to it wants to admit that silver and gold are legal tender, and that's awesome. If we can get more states on board, that's good because the state is basically where the power is. The states should be able to trade in silver and gold if they want to. There shouldn't be any reason why we can't do what the people want to be want to be done. And what Utah's doing, I 
commend it. I don't know how far it's going to go or exactly how it's going to turn out. We'll see. George Donnelly on the web. And this is a very appropriate question. Are you worried, personally, that you will be the next target of an FBI mugging and U.S. attorney prosecution like Liberty Dollar? Okay, the question is, am I worried about uh, future prosecution by the FBI, FBI mugging, as it was put? Yes, I am. I believe that when I get big enough, I will be a target. But the whole model of our business is to have different hubs sprout out throughout the United States so that by the time we get big enough, it's out of, it's out of my hand. That whether I'm indicted or they take away anything from me, it won't matter because the community will already be established. And once you have somebody trading in California, Michigan, Utah, you know, all throughout the United States, just bringing out simultaneously the government is going to have a hard time squashing it. it they might get me, but the, the whole point is it's not it's centralized. It, it's not done that way on purpose. Do you store your silver? You know, we, we have trouble um, in getting out the silver that people have ordered. As a matter of fact, we're, we're six weeks behind on orders. If we get silver in the mailbox, it's out by the next day to whoever ordered it. Yes, sir. Getting back to uh, drugs, um, are you familiar with a substance called Applegain? No, no, not Applegain. Igogain. Igogain, no. Made from a plant called Tabernacle Iboga. It's found in Ghana, Africa. The CIA has known about it since the 50s when they were doing their NPL studies. But Igogain has been found to uh, cure your, your addictions. Oh. The heroin, it's crack, the meth. And alcohol, that's another thing that right. should be widely right. known. Right. It shouldn't be something that, you know, and I'm, I'm, I find myself well versed in the drug laws, but I have no idea. And that's crazy that people don't know that there's other options available. Thank yeah. you. I had uh, Governor Johnson interested in looking into it, and he was going to start doing drug, drug trials or drug eradication in terms of your addiction. And the federal government stepped in and said, you're not going to do that. Because yeah, you can't cure the addicts if they need to sell the heroin coming out about the cancer. There's too much money involved, and it, it all goes back to the money, the, the, the purse. It, it's crazy. It, it all, all ties together. The drug war, community currency, Federal Reserve, it all it takes the power away from us. And that's, that's the whole point of, of this money conference, is to bring us back together and to actually get something going that can be constructive. Do you believe there's enough evidence on your daughter that the, the district attorney is worried more about his score on wins? Well, I think that's exactly what's going on. The question was, um, is the district attorney basically worried politically about wins and losses, and that's why they don't want to bring charges against this drug dealer? There were three people in the apartment when my daughter was murdered. Um, she was strangled to death, and I just found this out yesterday, that the person used 60 pounds of pressure on her neck and held it there for three to five minutes. She had the DNA of this person all over her, but because he says he didn't do it, and no one's coming forward as a witness against him, the DA decides they don't want to go to bat for my daughter, and it's crazy, because of the win-loss percentage. They want, they want the, the case to be on a silver platter given to them. Get me a, get me a, he said, tell, make the guy say he did it, a confession, and then we'll bring charges. It's crazy. What's the name of this district attorney? Uh, the district attorney is Ed Cameron. Karen, we have a web question. Is the lack of DA action perhaps an act against what you're doing with Del Valley Silver? The question is, is the DA action something that may be involved against the Del Valley Silver? And I don't think so. Uh, Del Valley Silver isn't that well known in the community yet to be a threat. Um, actually, it's making it maybe a little more well known 
as I talk about it throughout different communities. But no, I don't think that that really has, has a basis at this point. Okay, well, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your conference. That was interesting, and I learned a lot from that as well. Just wanted to let you know we've got coming up, it is quarter of the hour at 2 p.m. This is Eastern Time. Jim Babb will come up talking about the Spinner Devon Knot House. Knock it over, yeah. A good follow up to what Karen was saying. After that, at 3 p.m., we'll have Mike Salvi here. 4 p.m., Mark and Rose will come up from the back of the room. Now, since we have a few minutes, we were talking about maybe filling in with a, with a few small filler topics. And we have a member of the band, the Libertarian band, Poker Face, in the audience, but he did not bring his instruments with us, so I was kind of hoping he'd get up there and sing us a song. We're not going to get that. In a little while, we're having Darren Wolf coming up to talk about a new organization called Focus on Peace. And right now, I would like to say a few words since we have about, uh, what, 12 or 13 minutes before the, the turn of the, of the speakers. I'd like to say a few words about communication. One thing that we need to take into account, we as activists, we as libertarians, is to be able to present our message in a compelling and understandable manner. A lot of people can get up here and just talk and talk and talk, and you'll say, what was he talking about? What was the point of that speech? Or maybe they'll um, uh, like, you know, get up here and mumble, and whatever it may be. Fortunately, there is a way for any person, not just us liberty-minded folk, but anybody who wants to improve their communication ability, there's an international organization to do that. It's called Toastmasters. The mission of Toastmasters is to provide a supportive environment for learning public speaking and leadership skills. Personally, I've been a member of Toastmasters for, geez, I guess almost caught up on 14 years now. Before I joined Toastmasters, I would be scared to death to try and do something like I'm doing now. There are about, what, 20, 25 people in this room at the moment. Even with that, that number of people, I'd have asthma attacks. What Toastmasters does is, as I said, gives you a supportive environment where you can learn how to stand up and speak in public. There are all sorts of things that, that you can pick up from Toastmasters. The ability to present a coherent speech. The ability not to fall on the floor and faint when you're in the middle of the speech because you're scared to death. It also gives you the ability to run a meeting to how to set up an agenda, how to control people's talking. For example, there's a lot going on in the background right here that you can't see, and several of us are Toastmasters. We've got some Toastmasters equipment here to help us with the timing. Yeah, there's a Toastmaster in the audience giving me a double thumbs up. If you want to learn to present your message, if you want to learn how to present it coherently and without falling over, I would suggest you join Toastmasters. There are clubs all over the planet. There are over 10,000 clubs, over a quarter million members. Toastmasters has been around for over 80 years. If you go to toastmasters.org, type in your zip code, it'll show you all those clubs that are nearest you. One thing about Toastmasters, it is probably the best bargain on the planet. If you go to Dale Carnegie or something like that to learn how to speak, they'll charge you thousands of dollars. It'll last for a couple weeks. And did it stick? Yes or no? I don't know. Toastmasters, the dues is $27 every six months. 27 bucks. For the price of a decent meal, you can get yourself a decent speaking ability. Yeah, the price of a decent beer. We got people pointing to the beers <laughs> over here. Toastmasters changed my life. I used to be a very quiet guy, never, never did anything. And it led me all the way up the line until I got to the point where I was able to run for governor of Pennsylvania, to stand there on the inter on the national stage. And when WeWillFly.com took off a couple of months ago, I found myself on the international stage, taking media requests from Canada, from Britain, all over the country at all sorts of hours. It was Toastmasters that gave me this ability. Every Toastmasters meeting is pretty much the same. The first half are people giving speeches, some prepared, some impromptu. The second half of the meeting are evaluations of those speeches. And the speeches are always given in a positive manner. You'll never hear somebody say things like, Steve, that speech sucked. 
no, 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 no. You'll hear something like, Christine, that speech was effective, but it would have been more effective if you hadn't fainted in the middle of it. I learned diplomacy at Toastmasters because now I'm the one who's giving those evaluations. And my wife was like, where did you pick up those manners? Well, that was at Toastmasters. Change my life. Give you the ability to talk. I love it. Yes, we have a question. Really just a comment. Anybody in this room who's interested in joining a libertarian Toastmasters group, I am the new member chairman <laughs> for our own specific libertarian Toastmasters group in Kachaka. Let me repeat that question. We have Steve Sheets, who was our first speaker here this afternoon. He is the vice president of membership with the Libertarian Toastmasters Club. And we meet in Conshohocken, just outside of Philadelphia, libertariantoastmasters.org, if you want more information about us. Great club. And we're not all libertarians either. In fact, five of our last six presidents were not libertarians. And a couple of them weren't even citizens. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, okay. we have a question in the back. Can you pay your dues in silver? Can you pay your dues in silver? Do you know something? That very question came up because it is dues time right now. And our treasurer has graciously accept, said that he will accept silver. Since our dues are $27, we have a $3 club dues on top of that. So it's 30 total. He said if you bring in an ounce of silver, he'll give you six Federal Reserve notes in change. We're a libertarian club. Do it your way. Any other questions about Toastmasters? I'll just say, get out there and do it. It's the best single thing that you can do for liberty. All right, we've got about 10 minutes till we get to the top of the hour. So we will take a break and we will reconvene at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for your attention.